So last time we talked about refutation and how to refute arguments or at least take different angles on arguments based on the Toulmin model of argumentation. What we're going to do now is we're going to look at fallacies. And fallacies will be a way of helping you spot problems and warrants that people often have when they're making arguments. So fallacies are going to help you think critically. They're going to help you be able to refute things better and be more aware of your own thinking and how you can become a better thinker. So let's get to it. So the first thing is that we have inductive and deductive arguments. Deductive arguments are arguments that incorporate claims that make it impossible for the conclusion to be false if the premises are true. So when you're dealing with deductive arguments, you're dealing with necessary reasoning. So examples of deductive arguments might be things like math, two plus two is four, that's deductive, uh, definitions, categorical syllogism, so, you know, um, or disjunctive syllogism. So remember from Tolman, either A or B, not A, therefore B. That's a deductive argument, right? Um, the way it's set up, it's impossible for um, it to be not A and then somehow end up being A, right? So deductively, it's going to be B. Um, so deductive arguments, you're dealing with the logic of something where it's either possible or impossible. So when you're dealing with deductive arguments, math, definitions, categories, um, or disjunctive syllogisms, all of these things, it's either going to be possible for something to be true or impossible. So either Chris was present or Chris was absent. He can't be both. So it's impossible for him to be both. Um, so, you know, that deductively, that is the case, right? Because it's, it's impossible for someone to be present and absent at the same time. Inductive arguments, on the other hand, incorporate the claim that it's impossible for, or it's improbable for the conclusion to be false, given that the premises are true. So inductive arguments um, are about prediction, analogy, generalization, authority, signs, or causal inference, okay? So when you're making an inductive argument, you're arguing what's probably going to be true, okay? Um, so inductive arguments are about probability, okay? And so how probable is it that um, something is the case? So an inductive argument might be something like, so far, um, we have not discovered any unicorns okay in the world so probably there aren't any in the world right that's an inductive argument okay it's it's um by probability that you know we can't say absolutely that there are no unicorns in the world but so far from what we've seen we've scoured the entire world we've not seen any so they're probably not existent um but like a deductive argument would be something like um all bachelors are single, right? Or Mark is a bachelor, um, therefore Mark is a man. Well, yeah, deductively, if Mark is a bachelor, bachelor by definition is a single man. So therefore, yes, Mark is a man. Okay, that's deductive. It's not possible for Mark to be a bachelor, but then him be a woman, because then he wouldn't be a bachelor anymore. Does that make sense? So that's what we're talking about here. So informal fallacies then are mistakes in reasoning that usually occur in inductive arguments and you can only know them by looking at the content of the argument so you have to know something about what's going on like you have to know something about the content of the argument to detect the fallacy okay so here's an example the brooklyn bridge is made of atoms atoms are invisible therefore the brooklyn bridge is invisible okay so you know we know that the brooklyn bridge is obviously very visible but we also know that atoms are invisible so to really see the fallacy here, we have to know something about the Brooklyn Bridge and invisibility and atoms, okay? But once you see that, you know that this argument's not true. We can all see the Brooklyn Bridge, um, and so, you know, there's a problem here, okay? So that's an example of an informal fallacy. Now, fallacies then are often embedded in warrants, okay? So when we go back to Toolman, Okay, so you remember you have data, then you have claim. Okay, the fallacy is often here, okay, is in the warrant. So this is often what fallacies are going to be about. Now, what I'm going to do in this lecture then is 
I'm going to show you six kinds of warrants that arguments generally have that are not fallacious. Okay, so we're going to look at here's one kind of warrant, and here's how it's not here's how it's being used non fallaciously or being used soundly, and then we're going to look at how can that kind of warrant potentially become fallacious. Okay, so here's how this warrant can be twisted to become fallacious. Okay, so that's what we're going to do here in this lecture. So let's look at the first kind of warrant, an argument based on generalization. And so for each kind of warrant, I'm just going to put a W, so it's going to sound like text forms, but basically W1. So this is type of warrant one, argument based on generalization. So in this kind of argument, okay, um, we're arguing that what is true of a well-chosen sample is likely to hold for a larger population, or that certain things consistent with the sample can be inferred about the group or population, okay? So, for example, you might have, uh, let's see, claim, all right, uh, let's see, 70% uh, of people, we'll say U.S. residents, here, so I'll delete this, I'll, I'll just write it out before I box it. Okay, so claim, 70% of U.S. residents concerned about climate change. All right, cool. That's the claim. Uh, the we'll say the grounds is uh, so we'll say data a Gallup poll uh, done on uh, seventy percent done on random sample of Americans. Okay. We'll say a thousand Americans. Okay, so we're saying that 70% of Americans are concerned about climate change because a Gallup poll was done on a random sample of a thousand. So the warrant is that the uh, poll is representative of American beliefs. Okay, so that's the warrant. So. If the data, if the Gallup poll is random sampley, is randomly sampled, if it's large enough, if it passes all the tests of being a good poll, then this claim can be very strong. Okay, it can be a very sound claim. 70% of U.S. residents are concerned about climate change because there was a poll done and the poll is very accurate, reliable, all those things, and it appears to represent the American beliefs. Okay, so here we have a sound argument. Okay, using a warrant based on generalization. Okay. The poll is representative of American beliefs. Now, um, oh, I guess I actually wrote it out too. Forgot about that. Okay, but so you see the same thing in the text as well. So if you just wanted, if you just wanted to see what I wrote here, um, basically the same thing. Okay. Next, here's how that warrant can go bad. So one fallacy is called the hasty generalization. And this is where you draw a generalization about uh, a sample that is not representative of the group, okay? So basically, you're generalizing about people based on a really bad sample, okay? So what might be a bad sample, okay? Well, here's an example, okay? Uh, here, I'll just write claim. Claim uh, Arabs are all terrorists. Okay. And actually, we'll say Muslims because that's more common. Muslims are all terrorists. Okay. This is a claim that people will make. Not saying I agree with it, but just this is a common claim. Uh, the data will say um, 10. Uh, fundamentalists hijacked plane on 9-11, something like that, okay? And so the warrants, so the warrants then going to be something like the 10 fundamentalists represent all Muslims. And of course, we can see the problem there, okay? So that's fallacious reasoning, all right? So um, very small sample generalizing about 
a large group of people. Okay, so that's a hasty generalization. Okay, so when you're going to make a generalization, you have to make sure that the data actually represents the population, is representative of the population. In this case, um, you know, chances are if there's like 2 billion Muslims in the world, not all of them are getting on planes and killing people. Okay, so it's probably a very small percentage, not representative of the entire population. So here's the thing. Um, there can be exceptions to hasty generalization. So, and this is where it can get a little bit debatable. Okay, so small doesn't necessarily mean atypical, and large doesn't necessarily mean typical. So just because a sample is small doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad sample. An example might be, let's say you go to a beer factory, okay? And you know, you pull a beer off the assembly line, that one tasted bad. Then you pull another one off the same assembly line, that one tasted bad. And you're like, you know, I don't know if I like this beer. And you have a third one, you don't like it. You can probably safely say, if you've had three now off the assembly line, they taste bad, that you probably don't like that beer, even though you've had a small sample, okay? The reason you can do that is because beer is standardized, right? Like when it's made in a factory, it's all made the same. Um, and so either you're gonna like it or you're not, okay? So there it's okay because there's standardization. But in the Muslim case, not all Muslims are standardized. They're not all, they don't all believe the same thing. They don't all act the same way. They're all, they all have the same personality. So you can't make that claim based on the 10 people. And large samples aren't necessarily always safe because large samples can be biased, okay? If they're not randomly selected. An example might be, what if I took a sample of a thousand registered Republicans and asked them who they think will, who they want to win the election? I said, see, majority of Americans think Donald Trump's going to win the election. Well, the sample is a thousand Republicans, so of course they're probably going to pick their person, right? So large sample doesn't necessarily mean safe either if the sample isn't randomly selected, okay? So those are the things to keep in mind when you think about hasty generalization. So when we do statistical studies then, even if they're just using a sample of 150 people, that's not necessarily good and that's not necessarily bad. It's all about how the sample was acquired, okay? And that's what you have to look into. Then you have fallacies based on, uh, or another one based on generalization, which is the appeal to ignorance. And so this is when people argue that because a claim has not been demonstrated to be false, the claim is true, or vice versa. Okay, so um, this can go in different ways. You know, no one has proved that unicorns exist, therefore unicorns exist. Um, so it might look something like this. Unicorns exist because no one disproved them yet. And the warrant's going to be something like um, not disproven means proven or something like that or means existence. So it's kind of a strange warrant, right? So here we can kind of see the problem, okay? We can see the problem that, well, not necessarily, right? And this can go the other way as well. Uh, no one has proved that unicorns exist, therefore unicorns do not exist. Okay, so we could say it the other way, and that's equally false. Okay, so just because we don't know something doesn't mean that then you're right, is, is the idea. And just because we haven't disproven something doesn't necessarily mean that you're wrong. Okay, so that's the appeal to ignorance. So, the exception to appeal to ignorance is when it's well qualified people who are ignorant. So, for example, if we said scientists, okay, so if we changed it to, um, you know, scientists um, has disproved unicorns uh, or have not yet disproved unicorns, therefore unicorns exist, uh, you know, um, probably makes it a little bit weaker, right? Because we haven't seen them, you know, and we're talking about scientists here, same idea. Or uh, if you put it the other way, uh, no scientist has proved that unicorns exist, therefore unicorns do not exist. Okay, so now you kind of see like, yeah, that's a little bit stronger, you know, a little bit inductively stronger. We still can't say that unicorns don't exist, but 
because we're talking about the ignorance of people who are well qualified, who should know the answer to this or should be able to discover this, um, it's at least the argument's a little bit stronger. It's not necessarily right, but it's at least a little bit inductively stronger. Okay? So that's appeal to ignorance. So the next kind of warrant we're going to look at is the argument based on analogy. So we're on W2 now, argument based on analogy. And this is where you're extrapolating from one situation or event based on the nature and outcome of a similar situation or event. Okay? And so the links are generally uh, case-based or precedent-based, okay? And so in legal reasoning, for example, they'll say, in this previous case, the courts ruled this, and our case is a lot like that previous case. So that's a lot of that is argument-based on analogy. We are like this one case that the court ruled on. So you should count us as this. Um, so what's important in argument based on analogy is the extent to which the similarities can be established between the two contexts, okay? So here's an example of somebody making an argument based on analogy. Um, so this was given by an EPA secretary. Society should fight climate change with all of its resources it can muster, so that's the claim, because climate change causes damage similar to that caused by an invading army in a war. And we know that an invading army destroys everything in its path, okay? So that's drawing on climate change being like an invading army, right? And if, we're, if we would put all of our resources to stop an invading army from destroying our country, why not put all of our resources into climate change, which could destroy our country, okay? So that's an argument based on analogy. So technically, um, you know, it's sound at least in the sense that, you know, if you can establish that these two things are very relevant to each other, then great. Um, if the, the more further apart they are, the problem. So the thing is with analogy, for every analogy, there's disanalogy. So there's always gonna be some difference. The question is, will the difference make a difference? Okay, so that's what you have to look into. So here are the ways this can go wrong. First, of course, you can have uh, the fallacy of weak analogy. And it's just assuming that because two things share similar attributes in certain respects, that they share attributes in other respects. So, um, you know, an example would be, Gary's new car has a bright blue tint, leather upholstery, and a great gas mileage. Mark's car also has bright blue tint, a bright blue tint and leather upholstery. Therefore, Mark's car gets good gas mileage too. Okay, so we can see the problem there, right? Sure, they have these similarities about the blue tint and the leather upholstery, but that probably has nothing to do with whether it has good gas mileage or not, okay? So things can be similar, yet different, okay? So that's an example of weak analogy. We also have the fallacy of composition. And that it's assuming, and it assumes that because parts have certain attributes, the parts of something have certain attributes, the whole is gonna have that attribute too. Okay, so uh, here's an example of that. Maria likes anchovies. She also likes chocolate ice cream. Therefore, she would like chocolate ice cream topped with anchovies. Okay, so we can see the problem there. It sounds really gross. So yes. Maria likes the parts, but doesn't mean that she likes them together, right? Or just because the parts have this attribute doesn't mean that the whole has this attribute, okay? So, you know, uh, you could say like the, the football team has two teammates who commit crimes. Therefore, the football team is a criminal organization. Well, okay, I mean, there's maybe two people in the organization have committed crimes. That doesn't mean the whole organization is a criminal organization. Right? So that's fallacy of composition. Um, you can also think of this too, um, if you think of like, when you read stuff about like, I remember like with Subway sandwiches, there was that thing about, you know, there's an ingredient that used in Subway sandwich bread that's used in yoga mats, right? Um, so it's kind of that argument too, where it's like, um, just because, you know, hydrogen is in water, but did you know it's also used in hydrogen bombs? You know, that kind of thing. So um, just because it's in something in one context and it's bad, doesn't mean it's bad in another context when it's laced with something else. That's all chemistry, right? So hydrogen is used in bombs, but it's also used in water, okay? So um, same thing, fallacy of composition. Then you have the fallacy of division. 
And this is basically the reverse of composition. So this is assuming that because the whole has a certain attribute, each of its parts has that attribute too. So salt is a non-poisonous compound. Therefore, eating pure chlorine is non-poisonous. Okay, we see the problem there. So yes, the whole, the team, has a certain attribute, but that doesn't mean all of its members have that attribute too, individually. Okay, so um, you know, same thing with salt. Uh, if we were to do the football organization, you know, let's say we were arguing that the football is a criminal organization, but that doesn't mean that all of the members have committed crimes. Maybe there was a few of them who didn't, right? Or some of them who didn't know about it, that kind of thing. So if you work for Enron, uh, Enron might have committed crimes as a corporation, but it doesn't mean all of its employees committed crimes. Maybe some of them did, but not all of them. Okay, so that's the fallacy of division. The third warrant, kind of warrant, so W3, is the causal argument. Okay, the causal argument is about causality, basically, that a given occurrence or event is the result or affected by a previous event, factor X. Okay, we'll call that the X factor. Causal reasoning is the most complex of the different forms of warrants um, because there's a whole field in philosophy of the philosophy of causality that you can take a whole class on. What is causality? When is something considered a cause? When is something considered an effect? That kind of thing. But as a guideline, um, here's like an example of causal arguments. I have a headache because I've been having too much stress. Okay, so the, the claim is I have a headache. Data is I've been having too much stress. The warrant would be stress causes the headaches. Okay, so maybe that's right. Maybe that's not right. But, you know, that's an example of a causal argument. So here are the four criteria of causality. So whenever you read studies about something and it's like this new toxin is killing everybody, you know, that kind of thing. Um, here's how we establish causality scientifically. The first thing is the, the, the ch there has to be a precedence in time between the cause and effect, meaning the cause has to occur before the effect, okay? And we shouldn't be seeing the effect prior to the cause, okay? Because it has to be precedence in time. Secondly, there has to be a correlation between the cause and the effect. If we increase the cause or decrease the cause, something needs to happen to the effect, okay? If there's no correlation between the two, meaning that's just kind of random, like sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down, regardless of what we do to the cause, then there's probably not causality there. The third thing you have to do, and this is what a lot of people don't do when they, you know, when people put out, you know, studies that try to scare people is they don't rule out extraneous variables, okay? So the world has changed a lot in 20 years, right? There's more technology, there's Wi-Fi, there's cell phones, there's computers, there's all kinds of things that could potentially be giving us cancer, for example, that we don't know about. So uh, to say that this one thing is doing it, you have to rule out all the other possibilities first, okay? So you have to rule out extraneous variables. And then lastly, you gotta have a linking mechanism. So it's not enough to just say that this toxin is what's giving you Parkinson's disease. You gotta explain how the toxin does it exactly, okay? Does it change a neuron somewhere? Does it uh, hit the nervous system and cause some kind of chemical reaction? Um, because you have to have some kind of physical causal mechanism that allows the cause to take hold of the effect, okay? There has to be a mechanism by which the cause and the effect interact, okay? Whether that's through in neurotoxicity, uh, the nervous system, or the toxin getting into your gut and causing it to, I don't know, de decay or something, I mean, whatever. You gotta have some kind of linking causal mechanism. Without these four things, you have not established causality, at least from a scientific standpoint. So, fallacies and causes. So, the first one, of course, is the false cause. And that's basically when the warrant depends on imaginary connection. When the link between the premises and conclusions depends on some kind of imagined causal connection that probably doesn't exist, okay? So, here's an example. There are more laws on the books today than ever before, and more crimes being committed than ever before. To reduce crime, we must eliminate laws, okay? So, you kind of see variations of this. If we legalize this, if we legalize this thing, then we'll have less crime. You know, um, so it's basically arguing that crime or laws are what cause crime, right? Um, and so we can kind of see that, like, well, laws don't cause them per se, but people 
break the laws and then they get in trouble for it. Um, so probably people breaking the law is the cause and the crime is the effect, right? Something like that. Um, so that's an example of a false cause. Anytime you're, um, you know, misattributing a cause basically or an imaginary cause, then you're probably committing this fallacy. So you got to be clear about what the relationship is between the two things and how they relate. Then you have oversimplified cause, okay? And this is where when two, when something that has multiple causes is reduced down to only one cause and argued as such, okay? So the quality of our education in our grade schools has been declining for years. It's the teacher's fault. I mean, it might be partially, um, but if you think about the education system, there could be a lot of other causes. So to argue that as if, as if it's just this one cause, that's an oversimplified cause. You can argue this, that maybe it's a teacher's fault, as long as you acknowledge that there could be other causes too, if you want to be correct, if you will. Um, but to argue just it's this one thing, um, that's oversimplifying the cause. And so in which case you should be like, well, isn't that oversimplifying it a little bit? Okay, cool. Okay, then you have the slippery slope. And this is a big one in modern political discourse. And this is assuming that because there is no significant or little difference between two points on a continuum, that there's no important differences between even widely separated points in a continuum. So basically, um, you know, it's, our, it's something like this. If we were to raise the speed limit by five miles per hour, what's to stop us from raising it by 30, okay? Or if we let same-sex couples get married, then soon we'll have to let people marry their pets. So here's the problem in both of these arguments. So in the case of the five miles per hour, let's just say we had a little speed limit here. So let's say the speed limit is 30 right now and we wanna raise it to 35, okay? What people would argue with the slippery slope is there's no difference between raising it from 30 to 35 to all the way to 50, okay? Like changing it here is no different than changing it all the way to here. But of course, we can even visually see the problem with that. Well, we can draw the line here. We can make it so that, you know, well, I mean, if, if we just want it to be 35, we can just draw the line here. But we know there's a huge difference between 50 miles per hour and 35, right? We know that there's a big difference there and we can draw the line somewhere and be pretty clear about it, okay? Same thing here, right? If we let same-sex couples get married and soon we have to let people marry their pets, well, we can draw a line between, uh, a human being marrying another human being and marrying an animal, right? Like animals can't sign contracts, animals can't consent to anything, you know, animals can't fulfill marital obligations. So we can easily say, you know, two people can marry each other of the same sex, but they can't marry their pets. I mean, we can draw a line there, right? And so um, that's where slippery slope fails, okay? So when somebody tries to do this to you, you can say, well, we can draw a line here. I mean, we can say there's a difference between this and that, right? Um, and, you know, slippery slope is often used in gun control debates, right? If we, you know, somehow it starts with, if we do background checks, then soon, you know, the government's going to take all our guns, right? It's going to go all the way from background checks to full-on gun confiscation. Well, we can draw lines between a background check and give us all your guns, and the Second Amendment is gone now. We've deleted it, right? Um, we can draw lines between those, okay? But um, slippery slope is good rhetorically. I mean, it, it scares people. It gets people riled up. And so um, that's, that's where this becomes persuasion, right? Um, but it's not necessarily sound reasoning. Okay. Then you also have um, post hoc propter hoc. And this is assuming that because one event precedes the other, the first event caused the second. So this is the source of superstition. So like last time I wore a headband, the Chiefs won. So if I wear a headband next Sunday, the Chiefs will win again. So Basically, because I did this one thing and this happened, this one thing must have caused this other thing to happen, okay? Um, so just because two things precede each other in time doesn't necessarily mean it's causal, right? So I'm gonna go back to the four criteria of causes. Precedence in time is one, but it's not the only sign of causality. So all your superstitions are basically this. Then non-causa pro-causa, mistaking the cause for the effect. So for example, Successful business executives are paid $100,000 plus a year. Therefore, if we pay Thomas salary $100,000 a year, he'll be a successful businessman. 
So probably it's the other way around, right? If Tom is a successful businessman, then he'll make 100,000, not the other way around, okay? So this is where we mistake the cause for the effect. Now we're on to the fourth kind of warrant, which is the argument via sign clue, okay? This one can get students confused because they wonder how is this different from causal reasoning. So remember, um, causal reasoning about causes, but sign is about claiming that a certain datum is symptomatic of some wider principle or outcome. So let's just look at the example. There have been less sightings of eagles, therefore eagles must be decreasing in population. So this is sign reasoning, because here's why. I'm not arguing that less sighting of eagles, okay, so less sightings, okay, is causing eagles to decrease, right? I'm not arguing that. I'm just saying less sightings are a sign that something is causing eagles to decrease. So we delete this. Something is causing eagles to decrease, right? But it's not less sightings per se that's doing that, okay? So it's not less sightings, less sightings causing it. No, it's eagles are decreasing. There's been less sighting of eagles, and so the eagles must be decreasing in population, but I'm silent about what's causing it, right? I mean, it could be because there's more pollution. It could be because they've migrated. I haven't argued that what the cause was, okay? So that's the difference between sign reasoning and causal reasoning, okay? A sign is just a sign, but it doesn't attribute causality for the signified. It's just saying, I'm seeing this, uh, so maybe this, but it's not, you're not saying, I'm seeing this, which is causing this, okay? So you gotta know the difference there. So fallacies and signs clues. So of course you have the faulty sign, and this is arguing that one event or indicator is a sign for some other unre unrelated phenomenon. So basically being mistaken about signs and what they mean. Classic example, he's wearing his hat backwards, therefore he's a gang member, okay? So this is an example of a faulty sign. So just because somebody has their hat backwards doesn't necessarily mean they're a gang member. Maybe they're just a bro. Maybe they just like to wear their hat backwards. So this would be a faulty type thing because that hat backwards is just one indicator, but there's many more indicators to tell whether somebody's a gang member, right? So relying on just one and then making that whole conclusion is a bit faulty. Then we have argument from authority, okay? So this is the fifth kind of warrant. And this is where you're using your authority or expertise to support a claim. So somebody might just say, according to the National Science Foundation, one third of all research grants were awarded to the computer information science sector. So the claim is um, the uh, one third of research grants were awarded to um, the computer information science sector. So that's the claim. And then the, the grounds is the National Science Foundation. So that's kind of your grounds is the authority. And then the warrant would be something like the National Science Foundation keeps records on these things. Okay, so yeah, I mean, if the National Science Foundation is credible and they really do keep records on these things and they would know such things, this is probably a good argument, right? One third of research grants are awarded to the computer information science sector. Okay, great. Okay, so um, that would be a sound use of argument from authority. But here's how it can go wrong. Sometimes people appeal to force, so they use their position of power of justification. So they'll say, I am the manager, so I am right. So you might be arguing with your manager about something, and you might be right. The manager says, nope, I'm the manager, I'm right. Okay, so technically that's fallacious reasoning, um, but I don't suggest saying that, because then that probably will get you fired, because then you're, man you're like, well, that doesn't necessarily make you right. I took a critical thinking class. Um, manager probably won't care, um, so not good career advice to argue with them. But um, that is appeal to force. Bandwagon is using popular opinion as justification. So over 70% of Americans eat potato chips, so eating them must be okay. Okay, so we can see the problem with that. Sometimes Americans are mistaken. This is very classic um, for kids, right? You know, mommy, Chris and Mark get to go to Worlds of Fun on Saturday. Why can't I go? Well, if Chris and Mark jumped off a bridge, would you? Kind of the same idea, okay? Then you have the ad hominem attack. And this is rejecting a claim or an argument by attacking personal characteristics of the person supporting it. Okay, so we're seeing this a lot in this election. So Rush Limbaugh argued that the United States needs tougher immigration laws, but he's a drug addict, so we don't need to consider his arguments. Okay, so ad hominem is all about 
I make an argument, but instead of attacking the argument, you just attack me as a person. You start calling me names, you start um, attacking things that aren't relevant to the argument, right? Um, that's ad hominem, name calling, those kinds of things. So you can probably think of one person who's really good at this, okay? So um, that's ad hominem. So it doesn't really address the issues at hand. It just attacks the person for just talking, okay? Now, there are exceptions to this. So when you're arguing not, when you're not arguing that some argue, one's argument is bad, but you're arguing that the person is bad. So for example, in the Shakespeare um, controversy, okay? Shakespeare cannot possibly have written the plays attributed to him. He barely finished the fourth grade, was hardly literate, and never left England. So here it's okay because the claim you're making um, is that uh, Shakespeare couldn't have written these plays because he didn't have the background to, to make, to write such things, right? So no one, you wouldn't be like, that's an ad hominem attack. Well, no, it's just looking at him biogra biographically. It doesn't seem possible that he could have actually done these things, okay? So, or if you're going to argue that terrorists were immoral because they uh, killed a thousand people or whatever, I mean, that's not, you're arguing that the person is bad. You're not arguing that their argument is bad, okay? Um, so in that case, it's okay. So the key is, is that does it address the argument, okay? So if you just start attacking somebody personally, but it has nothing to do with the argument that they're making, it's probably ad hominem, okay? Another one that you see in this election, uh, it's called Tu Coque, or I like et tu, it's easier to pronounce. And this is evading an issue by arguing hypocrisy. Okay, so for example, uh, Democrats argue that we should not raise money on tax breaks for the rich, but Democrats waste money on entitlement programs. Okay, so basically it's, uh, you make an argument for something and somebody says, but you do it too. Okay, so here's a problem. Um, whether Democrats uh, waste money or whether wasting money on tax breaks for the rich is a waste or spending money on tax breaks for the rich is a waste of money, that's one issue, right? And we can, can have, we can just discuss that issue, right? Are we wasting money on taxes for the rich? You know, and we can have that debate, have that discussion. But it's independent of whether we're wasting money on entitlement programs. That's issue number two, right? So um, these are two separate issues then, okay? Um, and so we can evaluate number one and also evaluate number two, but issue number two doesn't cancel out number one, issue number one, right? So if we are wasting money on tax breaks for the rich, that doesn't excuse um, Democrats from wasting money on entitlement programs. Um, Democrats could also equally be wrong on wasting money on entitlement programs. And so in which case we need changes on both fronts, but they don't cancel each other out, right? So that's just a way of evading the issue. So if anything, we would say, okay, well, let's talk about whether we're wasting money on tax breaks for the rich first. Okay, so let's have that discussion. And then we can talk about whether we're wasting money on entitlement programs. Okay, so address the issue, just don't point fingers, that kind of thing. Then you have Warren Six, and that's argument from principle. And this is the last one. And this is locating a principle that's widely regarded as valid and showing that that situation exists in which the principle applies. So classic, murder is wrong, abortion is murder, therefore abortion is wrong. Okay, so you're taking the principle, murder is wrong, and you're saying that it applies in abortion, and therefore abortion is wrong. Kind of like argument from analogy in some ways, but instead you're, you're not saying um, that two situations are alike, but you're saying that there is a moral principle or uh, an abstract principle that's operating in both cases, okay? So um, that's that. But a lot of people don't have argument from principle because they consider it just a subset of argument from analogy, so I can understand that. So fallacies and assumptions or principles, okay? So you have the loaded question. And this is when you ask a question that has assumptions that aren't proven. So it's like me going up to you. So why don't you stop doing drugs, okay? So um, that question in itself has assumptions that, you know, aren't fair to you. And so that's a loaded question. So you'd be like, well, that's a loaded question. Um, I don't do drugs, you know, that kind of thing. Then you have begging the question, which is when the reason for the conclusion is not really different from the conclusion itself, okay? So a realistic one might be terminally ill patients have a right to physician-assisted suicide because they can't do it themselves. 
well, duh, if you're terminally ill, you can't do things yourselves, right? So it's kind of like terminally ill patients should have a right to position assisted suicide because they're terminally ill. Okay, so that's that's circular reasoning. Why should the terminally ill have that right, right? Like you have to say something that's independent of, well, they're terminally ill. You know, now you can say like, because they should have a right to control how they die. Oh, okay, that's, that's a little bit better, okay. Then you have other fallacies, and these are other important ones too, um, that I think are pretty relevant to the uh, modern discourse of elections and so forth. The red herring is when the arguer diverts the attention of the audience by changing the subject to a different but subtly related one. They conclude either about the different issue or assume one. So, um, gun control advocates argue that gun laws will make people more safe, but swimming pools kill more children than guns do. So the idea is to try to introduce a side issue when you're trying to defend against an argument. So here we're talking about gun laws, but now you're bringing in swimming pools and you're already trying to make this about swimming pools or swimming pools safe. That's a red herring, okay? So red herring is all about distracting you from the main issue. Um, two, uh, et two fallacy often does this too. So like, you know, you can say, uh, Donald Trump hasn't paid taxes in the past 10 years. Well, but Hillary hasn't, uh, Hillary's under investigation by the FBI for emails, you know? And then, so you kind of make it about Hillary instead of, oh wait, Donald Trump didn't pay his taxes, right? So um, there you're seeing red herrings thrown all the time, okay? And so then it's hard to actually focus on an issue because everyone just keeps bringing up a new issue when there's an issue with their candidate or whatever. So um, makes it hard to really have any progress in that regard. And then you have the straw man fallacy, okay? And this is where an arguer dist distorts an opponent's argument for the purpose of making it easier to attack. So an example, evolutionists basically argue that we're all monkeys. It's no wonder why we all have such lower, they all have such low regard for human life. So the straw man is this part, right? Um, you know, if you know, if you're really sophisticated and you actually, you know, learn about evolution, it, that's not the claim. The claim isn't that we're all monkeys, okay? Um, so it's a little bit more complicated than that, and it's a little bit more respectful than that, okay? So um, this is what a straw man would be, and you can see this in all other kinds of forums where it's like, the other side just wants this; they just want to take away our freedom, right? So when you see like pundits and all that stuff, um, they hate America. They just hate things and blah, 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 whatever. Um, these are all straw men. That's not what they're really saying. That's not really what they believe. It's like saying um, uh, anti-gun control advocates just want people to get shot. No, that's not what they want. You know, that's not what they're saying. They just, you know, they just believe that people should have the right to bear arms, you know, to a large degree. So that's what that's about. So straw man is all about being respectful of what your opponent actually, being respectful and being accurate about what your opponent is actually saying. And the more you exaggerate it, the more you oversimplify it, the less credibility that you have. So the conclusion. Warrants are critical to making claims based on data. And now you have some ideas as to how warrants work even more in depth and how they can go awry. Okay. And fallacies rely on assumptions. That's the whole thing about critical thinking. If anything else, don't assume. Like that's the only thing you learn in this class. Don't assume because that's the suspension of critical thinking. And there's a great website, and I'll post it too on the Moodle. Fallacyfiles.org is really good. You can get a lot of examples of fallacies, and there's tons of them on there. Um, and they give you plenty of examples too. So if you have trouble with a fallacy, you can go on there as well. Otherwise, that's pretty much it for this lecture. Uh, I look forward to seeing you uh, find some fallacies. <laughs>